I'm your host, Neil Langridge, and I'm delighted to be talking today to Paul Martini, CEO and founder of iVos. We'll discuss Zero Trust, or ZTNA, one of the most popular topics in cybersecurity right now. But we'll look at what it really is, what's actually achievable, how do we get there, and what it can deliver for organisations. Hi, everybody. I'm Neil Langridge, the Marketing Director at E92+, Plus, and welcome to the latest edition of our podcast, Return of the Hack. I'm extremely delighted to be joined today by a fantastic guest, uh, Paul Martini, who's the CEO of iBoss. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Right, so I think if we do a kind of a little bit of a, a, an introduction, if you want to kind of give a, a little bit of uh, background about yourself, and obviously it's fantastic to have, uh, you know, a, a founder of a company for kind of a little bit of, in terms of uh, how you got started with iBoss. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a technologist by trade. Um, I hold over 250 patents, uh, both in networking and cybersecurity. But I've done anything from ASIC design, um, all through software, large software architectures. And, you know, one of the things... Um, uh, where, I, where broadband originally started, um, I saw bandwidth obviously increasing exponentially. This is at a company uh, called Copper Mountain Networks, and basically there were there was it was when dial-up started moving into broadband. And one of the one of the challenges that I that I um, saw here was what happens when the you know eventually a phone or a device can't be restricted to an office. How can you apply the same security functions to the data? Yeah. Um, and also, like when bandwidth goes um, up exponentially, we were, we were talking at the time T ones, bonded T ones, OC twelve. So th- these were these were one megabit, four megabit per, per second uh, connections, which was considered high speed. What happens yeah. when this gets to a thousand megabits per second? So yeah. the challenge of just volume volumes of data plus the lack of um, restrictions in terms of where people could connect from. Um, I saw that as a as a big opportunity. I saw that as a big challenge, actually, and something that needed to be solved. So this was that was where um, this whole journey started, um, and that's where iBoss came to be. No, I mean that's fantastic. And as you say, there was all you know that kind of explosion was there, kind of ready to happen. And I suppose a lot of the kind of fundamentals, both in terms of you know kind of whether it's kind of kind of you know the, the structure and the technology behind email, whether it's network infrastructure, whether it's cyber security. All of that was designed for traditional network architecture in terms of kind of, you know, kind of castle and moat in terms of standard perimeter, everybody in the office, everybody on corporate owned devices. That's how security was designed for that. And then as soon as we had that that breakout and I suppose kind of devices like BlackBerry were kind of, you know, kind of initiators of some of that explosion, um, you know, security probably needed a bit of a rethink. Yeah, especially, you know, most people think of the iPhone is just common now, but we forget that that's you know 15 years ago that came, yeah. came out, and yeah. so that really drove um, the connectivity and the, the mobility, and obviously with COVID just solidified that you know that those changes, and I and I think you know our mindsets is you know I come both from the network and from the security side, yeah. the mindset is so different in terms of how you think about connecting uh, people as well as securing their, their transactions, and even if whether we do this on purpose or not, we tend to lean towards things we know. And um, and really try to fit fit circles into square holes where it just doesn't you know it doesn't actually work it doesn't work the same way so yeah and there's there's always been that kind of battle and I suppose it's kind of as as then it is it is now in terms of also wanting to balance security with productivity um, you know and I, I think that that challenge has become even more difficult because now I mean we're obviously all consumers um, and we we used to be able to use consumer technology with it being easy and flexible and it just works and it's all very intuitive and it's very mobile and and it, to a fair extent it's kind of unrestricted um, and security always needs to kind of balance that with user expectations that's right yeah it's a balance of end user experience um, security and compliance you know in order to run um, a proper organization less you know you can there's there's many things you can do with no security involved that are yeah. going to be you know in any part of our lives that is going to be faster think of an airport it's much easier to just run up to the plane at the last minute and be able to board it but we know that if you do that the risk of um, a situ of a very dangerous situation occurring is much much higher so like balancing the right level of access um, now you know you, you see these um, in, in in the states at least you have like the TSA pre-check where you can go faster, yeah. you do faster checks and things like that. So you do things to make the, that easier, but I do think that being able to be secure and compliant means that it's sustainability for a business and for an enterprise. Because a, a, a one, one crypto locker attack or ransomware attack, a data hijacking, those, that could be a dinosaur event. I mean, it's that, yeah. those, are, those are events that 
are not just destructive, they could put an end to a company. And I think that this is why this is so important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just you know, from a, it, just in a news perspective, we're seeing kind of potential uh, talk of a, of a hospital having to close down completely. You know, actually having to kind of shut shut the business, um, the organisation, because of the horrendous impact of a, of a of a recent cyber attack, and that's only in the last kind of week or so. So, absolutely. But th- that brings it on kind of nightly. And the, the example with the kind of TSA example that you've given is is there's kind of validation that's built into that process. So I suppose one of the the foundations, uh, kind of new foundations and frameworks have kind of risen in popularity in recent times. Obviously, you guys were kind of probably there a while ago in terms of the building blocks of getting towards that is around zero trust. So, you know, if you can kind of give us a bit of background in terms of, you know, kind of where you are with zero trust and, you know, kind of how you how you see that emerging as a, you know, a, a framework that a lot of organizations are now beginning to embrace. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And actually, you know, the way we see it is still quite different than than a lot of other vendors, uh, for example. So we, first and foremost, my belief and iBoss's belief is the best way to reduce your risk is to control access to resources. Yeah. The better you can control, the more tightly you can control access to resources, especially the sensitive ones, the, the lower your risk. Um, if an attacker doesn't have access to a vulnerable system, even if it's vulnerable, if there is no access, there's no way they can damage it. And they say that's, the, that's why this analogy of, a, of an airport works so well. The airplane is a vulnerable system, but if there's no way an attacker can get to that plane, they can't blow it up. That's the, that's the, equivalent, that's the equivalent of a ransomware grabbing your sensitive data and crypto locking it because there was a vulnerability um, in that software that allowed them to take advantage of that and gain access. There, there were studies by CISA, which was um, across the UK, Australia, and the US, that said all of the top three initial infection vectors for ransomware were due to unauthorized access. And they were, they were due to the vulnerabilities, credential theft, and, and um, a few other things. But ultimately, if that attacker didn't have access, that breach wouldn't have occurred, right? And so uh, we start with that premise first to say, the reality here is uh, controlling access to resources and making, them, making the request um, access decisions as granular as possible, meaning for each and every transaction, anytime someone wants to interact or exchange data with the system, there has to be a decision that's made of whether that transaction occurs or it doesn't. And it can't just be at the beginning of a, of a VPN uh, connection, for example. Yep. And so, you know, I think that um, there's this perimeter, you know, this explosion of the perimeter that has kind of pushed us in this direction because now, if you think about it, why are there so many breaches? Well, there's now more access to your resources. They're SaaS yep. applications. And, and actually, um, people, more people need access to those on-prem resources as well. Whereas before, there's only a handful of the company that may have had VPN access. And so because of this access, we're seeing this explosion in breaches, which makes, which makes a lot of sense. So we, we, the way we see this um, at iBoss is you really shouldn't think of SaaS applications and on-prem applications and cloud infrastructure resources as any different. They just happen to be living in different locations. Mm-hmm. There should be this idea that a user connects to a service, a zero trust service, and that service, based off who they are and what they want to access, makes a granular decision of whether that access occurs, whether that access is to a cloud application or to an on-prem application. But it's not really about um, a v, uh, strictly a VPN replacement, for example. We hear that a lot with things like ZTNA, where we have a VPN that connects you to the office, and I'm going to replace that with a ZTNA service to replace that VPN so to give people access to the office. Yeah, It's much, much more than that. It's it's We have users and employees that used to access only things in office, but now 80% of our applications are in the cloud as well. We need a service that can actually equally apply access controls, logging and visibility to all accesses in an equal and consistent way. So if I access something in office, I should be able to get a log event with detailed information. I should be able to cut access on the next request. I should be able to run DLP. I should be able to run CASB. All of these security functions you want to do the data just as much to the transactions to the office as those that go to the SaaS application, because the location should not change the, the, the perspective of how sensitive they are. So that's, that's where we, we said, we, we think, you know, having this idea of a uniform and unified security edge or service means that you connect your users to that service, you connect all of the sensitive resources on-prem and in the cloud and within cloud infrastructure to the same service. And then once you set a, a policy for access, for security, for visibility, it applies equally and consistently across all of the resources, regardless of where those resources sit. And now, once you do that, the user now can move 
and work remote or they could work on prem. It doesn't really matter because they're always connected to the service. And the access to those resources is granted through the service itself. Because one, one thing that's happening, we're seeing a lot of now too, is people are coming back to the office. Yeah. And, we, and we have to think about that situation as well. Like how does security get close to the resources so that you get the shortest path to that resource, but still maintain per request access decisions, um, per, uh, deep content inspection for DLP, for compliance and for security, as well as access controls. And so this uniform edge or this concept of the uniform edge or unified edge, I think becomes critically important um, from, no, from a security perspective, but also from an operational perspective as well. Yeah, I think it's really refreshing to think about it, as you say, not differentiating between on-prem and, and, you know, kind of potential cloud applications, because previously when people were on the network, they would have had access to, in theory, absolutely everything. Um, and, and, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be restricting a lot of those uh, kind of privileged accesses um, to certain applications or data repositories in exactly the same way that we should be restricting what they do kind of into the cloud. And I suppose that this, you know, the, 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 obviously COVID did fundamentally change a lot and people's perception of what productivity could be. I suppose over lot, overnight a lot of organisations are having to reevaluate because in obviously for entirely reasonable uh, decisions they made of rolling out a lot of VPNs, giving people a lot of access, which definitely salvaged a lot of organisations, kept them alive because they could keep people productive. But now they've got to completely revisit what they're allowing their employees to be able to access and potentially having to row back a lot of those people. So I suppose that's a, an opportunity that organisations can take to re-embrace you know, the permissions that they're giving everybody and actually who needs to access what. Yeah, Neil, I mean, think about that example that you just gave. Um, in the, the issue was we gave people access to everything in the office. And the, the, what was in the office? Well, there were sensitive applications and resources that yeah. if they were damaged, we'd be in trouble, right? Where's, where does Zoom exist? Where does SharePoint exist? Where does my, Microsoft Office yeah. 365? Those are all cloud apps, but yet, it seems that everybody just has free access. I mean, it, it's up, it's publicly on the internet. There's yeah. a username and password, but they have access to the front door that allows them to punch in usernames and passwords when in reality there should be no access unless you're someone that works for the company. Yeah. So if you use the same concepts across SaaS to say there should be no access at all to that application, not just that login time, I don't want you to be able to present your passwords or be able to get to that resource unless you're coming through this um, through, through a service edge, for example, that says, yes, you're authorized to present your credentials to that application, that puts you back in a position where now you're, you're tightly controlling access to all resources regardless, regardless of location. Now, I would also add, um, you know, because I, I see a lot of confusion as well where, you know, it's not just from a network and a security side. I think that the vendors also, this, this, this is also driven by a lot of vendors where, you know, you, we want to be, we have a VPN, so we want to replace this with another VPN. But this yeah. VPN happens to be a ZTNA VPN, which which is better because we're going to control access to resources. But what? But the challenge is when it looks like a VPN because the user opens the application, they click connect. At that connect time, it checks their posture, it checks their security and their login, and then it gets, grants them access to certain things. When in reality, this idea, if you look at the NIST 800-207 zero trust architecture, which is being adopted broadly all over the world. Now, the, all the reference architectures that I'm seeing from ISO, for example, they're all converging towards the same model. It talks nothing about turning on a, an application to then gain access to an office. Yeah. It says a user is just connected to a service, that service is continuously evaluating what it is they want and, make, and making the decision and establishing the connection to that resource for that transaction and then ending that transaction. So that it's basically like what I would consider almost micro VPN in a sense, where you're, yeah. it's a micro VPN that applies to all services, cloud, SaaS, on-prem, and it's doing this on every single access request. So I think this is important um, because if that's missed, it's not just a poor end user experience, it also is a, a poor security posture because it's still centered to just the office. And it's also, um, the security checks are only happening at VPN startup time, or yeah. let's call it ZTN startup time. And I, and I think tying in user experience is, is really important, um, not just from a, uh, a kind of productivity perspective, but also from a security perspective, because the worse we make a user experience and the more difficult and the less productive, um, the more people try and find ways around it. So, you know, I kind of I think sometimes people forget it's easy to forget that the value of a user experience being 
embedded with with best practice security because then people are going to encourage uh, be encouraged to follow it and are going to embrace embrace it rather than having to go oh this is a challenge and then i've got to have a vpn client and then i can't use my mobile or then i can't sit and use my ipad it, we present more challenges with a poor user experience which means people just find shortcuts and people always do find shortcuts yeah yeah exactly i mean I, I, there's one clear example there's um you know when you look at um, some popular private access products if you look at the solution They'll, they'll say things like, you can inspect content on private access. It doesn't have, there's no capabilities to do that. Yeah. But on the internet, on an internet access, that product, that'll do the DLP, the CASB, the per request access decision. I think that the mere fact that there's differences between the pri a private access product, product and internet access, why wouldn't you want to be able to provide per request access decisions, CASB, DLP, just because data is flowing between a user and something in the office, which happens to be just as sensitive Maybe more so in some many cases because those definitely yeah. are enterprise owned applications. So once you start bifurcating products to kind of glue them together to form a bigger product, you're going to end up in differences in capabilities. Um, with, for example, private access not inspecting content, not providing per access decisions, and internet access doing per access decisions and, and, and security. But now we flip the experience for the administrators. They need to be able to have a place where they set a policy for access or for security visibility, and and know that that's gonna apply in all use cases, whether you're connected to the office, to SaaS, or whether you're a contractor, whether you're an employee. And I think that, that simplicity also means you're gonna be in a better security posture because it's less complexity. The more complex a system is, the more likely there's mistakes in policies, and the more complicated the configuration becomes, or maybe even the deployment becomes, which then ends up hitting the end users as well, because they end up with a poor experience, with slow connections, for example. Yeah, a lack of consistency in policy, I think, is only going to make things like kind of compliance even harder. Um, and it also adds workload. And we all know the challenges a lot of organisations face right now in terms of, you know, kind of skills gap and insufficient workload of having to do more with less. The more complexity you add into any system is, is, is not ideal. And I think everything you've talked about, about having a more integrated approach also kind of plays into that, that drive that I think that kind of collectively as an industry we need as well, with kind of greater integration of complementary products being able to work closely in terms of you talk about DLP and CASB and there's probably authentication in there as well uh, you know around being able to verify uh, identity it, it's really important that we have more of these uh, products kind of working together and having that consistent approach um, to be able to make sure that we we do plug those gaps and we you know kind of it's what organizations really really need to be able to make things as as efficient as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, one of the best things that I, that I love about the Zero Trust architectures, especially those from the NSA 100 to 07, is what it does for the, for the concept of platform. Yep. The, 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 uh, my, from my perspective, the legacy approach of platform was a company buying a bunch of vendors, trying to consolidate, and, uh, consolidate them into a single solution, and you end up with a very, not just kludged solution, where you feel things are just, you're, you're chasing the wrong dream, which is we're chasing the single pane of glass, experience for an administrator versus a single platform. With with this new concept, what this means is using standards for protocols, things like REST and JSON, which are which are standard uh, languages that, that uh, different uh, technology um, speak. What it means is now you have a centerpiece. If you have a proper zero trust policy enforcement point, a zero trust service, it becomes a centerpiece for access controls, which is the risky part. Then now the ecosystem around it is all of these other technology products that are best of breed but aren't necessarily owned by a single company. You might have best of breed identity. It could be Microsoft um, um, for identity. It could be others as well. Um, you might have um, Endpoint. Maybe it's CrowdStrike or others that are um, good, end, great endpoints that are providing signals to the airport security checkpoint to say, hey, we just saw something expect someone's going to show up in the next hour don't let them on the plane yeah and it's the same it's the same thing but this ecosystem goes anywhere from device management to to endpoint to threat feeds because now you can use all of these and they talk about this as a trust algorithm all of these as input signals which are which are educating the policy enforcement point to make a more informed decision of whether that next access should occur or not and and it also makes it so that you don't end up with a lot of disparate products it's all glue it's all connected together in a uniform way so that you can apply all of this technology in a consistent way to reduce risk. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's definitely, a, it, it can see why it's becoming kind of uh, kind of popular. But I suppose that there are obviously going to be challenges uh, for organisations. I suppose, you know, they're going to come in twofold. There's going to be things like budget. And I'm sure there's a lot of organisations that are looking at and going, I've just, you know, because of COVID, I spent an absolute shed load of money on uh, VPN licenses, uh, uh, you know, kind of potentially or kind of rolling out more cloud infrastructure. You know, we're all hoping for consolidation, but actually that meant even more kind of firewalls and what have you. And then there's the practical Localities. I think if you're, you know, a larger organisation in the enterprise space, then potentially you have the the capacity to be able to deal with this. But kind of going down into kind of, you know, mid market and below, you know, kind of, you know, what are the practical challenges that organisations face in kind of seeing the potential for zero trust, um, you know, kind of using ZTNA technologies, but you know, actually getting to that point of kind of moving towards, you know, there's always an ideal, but it's a journey. But you know, what are the challenges they face in terms of implementing, you know, kind of this sort of this sort of uh, framework? Yeah, look, look, one thing we know for cer certain is bandwidth is going to continue to go up. Look at 5G. There's no slowdown in the amount of connectivity. Users need that connectivity. Mobility is here to stay it's, and it's going to continue. Whether you're working in the office, there's always a hybrid version of that. It could be from your phone, it could be from a laptop as people work from home. So the ability to, and the need to connect those people so they can be productive at any time when they need to be productive is, gonna be, is not going to go away either. Yeah. And so what I what I look at is this should be better security, but also improve your costs, like reduce your costs and put you in a position where your costs are maintained and don't continue to increase because you're trying to fight the fire with the with the wrong weapons. Buying more apply, for example, network security appliances. It may work now, but what are the constraints? They don't really apply to the remote users, so you don't have visibility and security. And they also have limitations on the amount of bandwidth that they yeah. can handle. So you're going to need to buy a bigger appliance or Deal with the fact that your employees are working at a slower rate. They're less productive because you can't get more bandwidth because the security appliance won't, won't support it. So you should get the budget from these existing technologies. So things like network security appliances, proxy appliances, grab that budget because that same capability is provided by a service, but at infinite scale. You're paying per user so you can actually get more bandwidth. You can protect all the users from where they go and you're transitioning the budget to that service. VPN. If you're using a VPN, you may have bought more VPN, but guess what? You're gonna to have to continue to buy VPN because those VPN concentrators have limitations on how much bandwidth they can they can support. And those users are likely working at 50%, 30% of their capacity because when they're on that VPN, it's incredibly slow. Yeah. So what does that mean in terms of cost every single day when you have employees that are only working at 30% of the capacity because they're waiting for things to load? But sir, you grab the budget from that from the VPN, move it to a, to a zero trust security edge, and when, once that happens, they're going to get faster performance and better end user experience. The productivity alone will pay for the, the, the extra money you spent during, during COVID. And then I, I look at other things like browser isolation, which is the equivalent of VDI, virtual desktop, where you have contractors or guests. Instead of buying all of that infrastructure, use browser isolation, which provides that instant, that pane of glass instantaneously, but is connected to the, to the zero trust, meaning you connect those contractors to on-prem resources. It has the DLP, the CASB, because it's part of the security service edge. So now you have a consolidated solution, which is moving budget from VPN, proxy appliances, network security appliances, any firewalls that are doing decryption, and um, and uh, VDI um, into one solution, which is ultimately lower cost, not just from a from a licensing perspective, oper operating it as well. You know, sending people to data centers. To, everyone's done that. Staff is staffing is hard. Being able to get those people to go to those data centers, um, they can repurpose those same people to get more value by working in a platform that works at scale. They're gonna do the same networking and security functions, but they're just gonna do them instantaneously at scale and apply those to all the users um, at the same time. And I, I suppose it really plays into that, that that drive a lot of organizations are looking for around vendor consolidation. I mean, that you know, there's benefits in terms of the management and in terms of the cost, but in terms of the just the efficiency, and as we touched on earlier, in terms of simplicity of approach, because if you have multi-cloud and you have, uh, you know, kind of on-prem to be able to deal with, and you have disparate solutions that kind of, you know, uh, and point products that address those different areas, you're kind of automatically introducing more complexity into your, your, your cybersecurity strategy. Well, especially when that, um, that it's a centerpiece, it's the, it's the airport security checkpoint, which means all of those other technologies should consolidate around. If there's complexity in that centerpiece, then all of the other things you want to do from a consolidation perspective become just as much more complex as well. For example, if private access can't look at each and every single request, how is CrowdStrike or an endpoint going to tell it to cut access? It can't. 
Yes. It's, it's, there's no visibility into those requests. So I think that's really important. Um, simplicity for, around to administrators, to end users, better security, and long-term sustainability as well. Yeah. And, and one, one of the other things you kind of absolutely talked about connectivity, and I think that one of the things that that, that kind of explosion of connectivity um, in terms of speeds and, you know, the kind of re, uh, kind of reduction in the cost um, from a, a hardware perspective has enabled more devices to be Internet enabled and connected. Ever. You know, we talk about IoT, but also kind of, you know, the digitization and connectivity of a lot of OT technologies as well um, that, you know, we're seeing in the office and we're seeing in infrastructure and utilities and critical national infrastructure and all, all sorts of things. How does kind of zero trust potentially kind of play into those areas and, and how will that change how we secure those networks? Because they're even more complicated as well because they don't always have a, a user on the end and a, you know, a simple VPN that they connect. If you're having smart warehouses or kind of, you know, kind of sensors on kind of pipelines, you know, how, how can zero trust kind of embrace those challenges around connectivity and around being able to have visibility and control over those? Yeah, the, the NIST 800 Zero Trust Architecture uses the term subject versus user because yeah. the subject could be a non-human entity. They use the term asset versus laptop because an asset could be any IT, OT, yeah. um, you know, any, any type of um, non-human used device or, or manufacturing device. And so the, it just changes the way you connect those things to the service. So the service should be flexible enough to be able to allow things that don't support software agents or you know, can interact with, let's say, browser isolation. They should be able to support things like forward proxy, um, SOX proxy, FTP relay, like all of these things there, that these systems are used to communicating with, but those systems should still go through per request access decisions. The data will arrive, there'll be a little less context because obviously if it's a human and we're running and you're able to scan the, the system with software to find the MAC address and all these other things, um, there might be a little less context, but the controls, the access controls are also a lot more uh, uh, tightly set because yeah. we know that that um, OT should only be communicating with this other resource and we can time down those communication paths so there's no east-west traffic. And so there's only communication to, towards between trusted um, trusted data that's been approved through the policy enforcement plans. Yeah, and I, and I think the potential of being able to to be able to kind of roll out OT, um, you know, a lot quicker in terms of connectivity and IoT, kind of you know presents kind of you know enormous benefits for you know a lot of organisations in terms of being able to, to to drive productivity, being able to drive automation, and you know, just likewise with the with the IT team of being able to get people to be more productive and more efficient in higher value roles. Um, and, you know, kind of in terms of the sheer amount of data and, and information available, you know, there are huge benefits there that I think organizations can, you know, kind of potentially embrace without that fear of, of a lack of control. Because I think that, you know, the kind of the sheer volume of data, like we see connectivity uh, kind of rapidly increasing, the sheer volume of data is doing exactly the same thing. And there, there's, a, there's a natural fear of being able to have control and visibility over it all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think, um, I think that is the issue is, the, the lack of visibility, the lack of access controls is really the core issue. And yeah. I think that if we can apply that equally and consistently across all types of assets, resources, users, not service accounts, and protect, start with the things you're protecting first, which are the resources, put the checkpoint in front of it, which is the service, and then connect all of the users. That's no different yeah. than an airport model. You start with the airplanes first, then you put a checkpoint yeah. in front of it, then the passengers arrive. It's not the other way around. If you do it that way, it's an actual much easier problem to solve because there's much less planes than there are people that want to board those planes. Yeah. And so it really helps you understand the surface area. This is what we're dealing with. This is what we're protecting. We need to get visibility on who wants to interact with this resource in a really tightly um, and a controlled way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think one of the, the, the kind of, obviously, that we could, you know, as we've discussed, there are, there are huge benefits available, but we often see whenever there's a kind of, you know, an emerging strength around cybersecurity, then we're obviously going to see a challenge from the, the cyber criminals and the bad actors out there. You know, as, as Zero Trust, I'm sure, kind of becomes more popular and gets, gets taken on, um, you know, are we likely to see a kind of a bit of an arms race? What do you think the kind of, you know, the, the response or what are you seeing out there in the market in terms of how, 
how the you know how kind of criminals are beginning to respond to more organisations taking this approach because they're going to they're naturally going to see that as a as a you know as a threat to their business model and they're going to need to adapt and survive. So are you beginning to see changes in trends in terms of how they're they're potentially looking at organisations uh, embracing zero trust and how they may then look to be able to then compromise that approach? Yeah, look, I'll start with um, there's no silver bullet. Like if people think there's a silver bullet that's going to end all of the breaches, there's no such thing. Actually, there's nothing in our life outside of cybersecurity that has 100% certainty. Whether you're getting insurance for your home, your car, their accidents can still happen. But what I can tell you that is that if you use other analogies, a, 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 a cyber criminal, an attacker is no different than any other criminal except they're using technology to commit the crime. If yeah. there's cars with no locks on them, they're going to go after those first. They're just easier. If there's cars that don't have alarms on them, they're going to go on those cars first. And if there's cars that have low jack or other, they're going to avoid, try to avoid those first. Now, it doesn't mean that they're, they're not going to ever steal those types of cars. I think what will happen is that the trend will be to go after those that don't use a more secure posture because it'll be easier. Their yeah. end game is to get ransom and to do those ransom. They don't want slowdowns. And if, you know, because of the evolution and the progression of, this, of the maturity of the space, they know there's plenty of organizations to go after. I think eventually, as the models become more mature and more organizations have that, then they're going to come up, they're going to work with the least friction to the most friction to figure out where is the biggest reward and try to figure out how they can try to game the system, spoof the system, and come up with other techniques. But, you know, currently where we stand right now, there's a vast number of organizations that have no tight access controls. Um, so they're going to continue to go after those with first. And I think that there's others that have implemented what, what they think is zero trust, they call it ZTNA, but it's just purely a VPN replacement, leaving no, no consistent edge that has protection for SaaS or per request to access decisions within the content running, running DLP, CASB. So they're, they're just a little bit better, um, still shielded compared to the others, but those will be probably next. And then eventually it'll be the much harder, the much tighter yeah. controls. Why go after Fort Knox when you can go after, you know, tons of other places that are less, much less secure? Yeah, it's always the path of least resistance. Obviously, we saw that, you know, immediately kind of during COVID when it, when we saw the increase in working from home, then immediately there was exploitation of how many different VPN uh, software applications as, as they realized that those home users were kind of huge kind of potential potential victims. So, you know, obviously with, with more organizations kind of gradually moving over to, to more of their infrastructure in the cloud, are we likely to see kind of potentially cloud infrastructure as well being more of a, you know kind of more of a more of a target and is there going to be a need for kind of you know even a tighter integration between um between organizations their it teams cyber security providers and the, the big hyperscale cloud providers who obviously you know kind of where you know kind of have so much of that market in terms of they obviously have a shared responsibility but is that an area where we're going to need to kind of continually evolve and tighten up because it's those those gaps between those different uh, kind of uh, organizations um and those different infrastructures where the you know kind of potentially the bad guys could get in yeah, absolutely. Look, we're, we, we're going to live and we live in a multi-cloud environment. I mean, that, that won't change. And there's the titans that are going after cloud space. You know, you have the AWS, you have um, Microsoft Azure, and they're, they're always going to compete. But you're, going back to where we originally started, your resource, the location of a resource is irrelevant, whether it's inside of one of the cloud providers as infrastructure, um, whether it's SaaS or whether it's on-prem. So this idea, the idea of a real, uni, a real uniform zero trust approach means that you're treating all these resources equally and consistently, putting a consistent policy, security, and visibility edge in front of all of them. That includes the on-prem just as much as it does the stuff in the cloud so that you understand every single access control and get, and get visibility into those. So there'll always be controls within those cloud providers, but you'll need to have something that spans beyond the cloud providers to your SaaS and to your on-prem as well as have, has a consolidated approach to policy enforcement and policy visibility, which then makes your the organization, organization as a whole more secure. Um, definitely cloud infrastructure, um, Lambda functions, for example, in AWS, which are using just our codeless um, uh, types of approaches, which are interacting with APIs, those should run through policy enforcement points. They should have visibility and they should have access controls. They should, that should be very tight and they should only allow those APIs to talk to other resources that are in a very small list, likely, and, and there should be logging as well of every single request so we can see volumetric transfers, differences in the payloads, 
There might be maybe transfers or uh, parameters or other things they're using to hijack data. Definitely, those that area is is where the where the attackers are going to look and where the zero trust edges are covering as well and should cover. Yeah, I mean, and, and any connection point or any data transfer should be subject to you know kind of the same policy, well, the same approach in terms of that verification, assumption of zero trust, and the verification every single time to make sure it's it's legitimate. So I suppose it, you know it's going to require an organisation to you know visibility. Is something you kind of touched on uh, kind of earlier. That's going to be absolutely essential for an organisation to have a full awareness of you know kind of every touch point, every cloud infrastructure, all of their applications, and and I think that's definitely going to be one of the challenges organisations organizations face because you know with the rate of scale and growth that they've had in cloud and the ease of adoption of definitely um, kind of you know applications and infrastructure outside of core IT or core cybersecurity teams because hey marketing can start spinning up in, you know instances of Marketo and connect to Salesforce and use the APIs and they don't even need to talk to IT necessarily about it so I think that the, the way that kind of departmental technology has evolved um, and where I kind of core IT and central IT might not have visibility, I think that's going to be one of the challenges that they're going to face in terms of just making sure that they they have visibility of absolutely everything that's connecting to their their network or their applications. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So I, one of the things we kind of touched on earlier that I think is kind of interesting, I don't think we necessarily always t- talk about it quite as much as we we should do, was just on you know kind of di- uh, on individuals and their approach and, and and people kind of having that expectation around a better user experience. Uh, are you kind of is it, some of these changes going to come because we're going to see people whether we refer to them as kind of digital natives or cloud natives, the changing workforce in terms of not just working from home but the sort of technology they've been brought up with. Is that going to help drive some of these changes? Where people are kind of used to being able to interact and access ac- accessing applications in an, in an entirely different way and, and, and therefore kind of redesign a little bit how we think about security too. Yeah, look, I think um, the generations that are coming have been born and have grown up in technology, right? So they're going to be more uh, digital, digitally oriented from the start. Um, yeah. Now, there is a, there's also a challenge if they're used to just getting free access and unfeathered access to um, whatever whatever they want, then balancing that with expectations of security as well. And so um, I think there's going to be a nice and, and, and healthy balance, but they're going to be technically savvy enough to understand how these things work. I do think that as these applications continue to move from on-prem to SaaS is really where it makes the, like there's a, there's a shrinking amount of applications that, you know, you see with Microsoft, for example, they start to announce the end of Active Directory and yeah. things like that, right? Once all those things occur, the only way to consume an application will be SaaS. Which actually, for me, reinforces why you want a unified edge and you want to think about zero trust properly. Because if you're thinking about it on prem and you've built around that, slowly but surely, these applications are leaking out to, to the cloud and eventually there's nothing left. And now you have a solution that's connecting you to a hollow office that has yeah. nothing sitting there, right? And so I think what will happen that's going to ease a lot of this is those applications will continue to go SaaS like they've been going eventually 100%. And now the access is not even. It is actually not relying on perimeters at all because it's an employee sitting in an office is no different than someone sitting at home. And those yeah. applications are accessible through the service edge without any special tunnels or configuration or anything like that. It just makes the process a lot easier. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think we're kind of coming up to the, the, the top of our time, but I think it, it feels remiss in terms of um, kind of, you know, where we are and everything that we talk about, not to not to mention AI, um, because it's, you know, it's just kind of a little, little bit inevitable right now. Um, you know, kind of what are you seeing out there in terms of the kind of, you know, the threat landscape? Um, you know, and, and, and how AI kind of potentially is going to be going to be used in this. And I think, you know, kind of when we think about kind of kind of trust and identity and verification of that, I think the ability to kind of potentially kind of, you know, impersonate or kind of confuse individuals in terms of appearing more, more, more human like um, in terms of, you know, whether it's code, whether it's emails, whatever it happens to be. Um, where are you seeing kind of, you know, kind of AI potentially evolving as an increasing kind of threat from a, a cybersecurity perspective? Well, look, AI is huge, and actually the implications in cyber are huge as well. So we're, we're doing a lot with AI in terms of modeling, training, and, 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 use, and, and applying this from, a, from the good side, right? Um, and that, that, the, the power of what that can mean in terms of allowing organizations to scale their teams, both from a security and network, because you have, in a sense, assistants that are able to look at every piece of content and make decisions on those contents without that, that were not possible for is now possible, the attackers are yeah. doing the same thing, right? So we, we're moving from 
attackers simply creating polymorphic malware by recompiling code to really using AI to, to adapt and, and change that code, not just with simplicity, but with more complex algorithms to get the, the malware into the systems. Um, not only to get through um, authentication prompts and things like that, but also um, to do discovery. You know, discovery, what, discover, tell me more about this organization. What does the yeah. landscape look like? But let's go back to those sensitive resources. How many of those are SaaS? How many of those are not restricted to us an edge? And can you can you attempt to put passwords in? And does it? And if it does, does it accept the credentials? Even if it rejects you, um, is it accessible? Right. And so, it's definitely a whole new era. Definitely for the attackers with AI, the models and the the, the uh, models that we're testing are so advanced that it is the implications of what it means to cyber is is it shouldn't be ignored. And I think it's it's the next it's the next wave here, um, obviously for. Um, what it means for attackers, but also what it means for the people defending and, and supporting the network and security teams as they defend organizations, because they're going to be able to do the things things that were before impossible are now become possible. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, fundamentally, fundamentally changing. So, um, just in terms of just uh, kind of finishing off, I always like to be able to kind of you know give a, a simple takeaway. So, for for anybody listening, in terms of a, an IT practitioner or maybe maybe a partner looking to to help their their customer in terms of taking their their first steps along uh, towards embracing or evolving their their zero trust um, kind of strategy. What would be the what would, for an organization that kind of hadn't started that, or was very much at the start? What is a kind of you know simple, practical kind of first step or a takeaway that an organization can do to kind of start moving along that journey? Yeah, it's actually um, from my perspective, really really straightforward. Start with this uh, security service edge or, or zero trust edge. Start with SaaS applications like Microsoft Office three sixty five, Zoom. There's tons of applications. Connect those to a service edge. Now you have access controls and discovery. Connect the users and employees to the service edge. Use the agents, um, use agents, and that's what zero, the Zero Trust architecture recommends. Why? Because they can do posture checks, like check the firewall, check if the disk is encrypted before granting access, so it gives a lot more context and visibility. Now you have users who are able to access those resources from not just home um, and on-prem, but in a very secure way with logging, CASB, malware defense, DLP, and visibility. Then introduce the on-prem resources so if there's on-prem resources, connect those as you decommission a VPN. And then and then lastly, bring in the contractors um, with browser isolation. So you can do a pane of glass, you can connect those contractors to those resources. I, I tend to see the second phase and third phase, those could be interchanged if you have contractors, for example, that are interacting with sensitive resources on-prem. Using something like browser isolation is very easy because of uh, the pane of glass, keeps the data separated and solves that use case without having to give those contractors VPNs. But I would, I would start with, Simplicity, um, a service edge, uh, push the eight, some agents, get them connected, and then with that alone, you're gonna be in a much, much better place, both from a security perspective, visibility perspective, as well as with the ability to show value from a risk reduction perspective. Yeah, absolutely, and I suppose it's also that verification and confidence everybody has in in embracing this approach. Because for a lot of organisations, this is going to be completely different to how they've uh, how they've approached uh, cyber security and, and you know kind of network security up until now. Definitely, absolutely. Smashing. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's been a really, really good discussion. Um, I think we, yeah, definitely learned a lot. I really appreciate your time. Um, to everybody uh, listening, thanks very much. Uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe and make sure you don't miss the next edition of it. Uh, but for now, Paul, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Absolutely. Great being here. Thank you.